Hello, this is Michael Campbell with Glossika, and I'm delighted to have here today in person Sarah Maria Hasbun from Meridian Linguistics. And she is the founder of this company that provides linguistic solutions to companies that are entering in new markets. She's been living in East Asia for many years, uh, speaks fluent Chinese, and she also provides, um, and I, I had the opportunity to actually experience and, and listen to her uh, speech here at the Polyglot Conference and as she was going over all of the different languages of Asia and her deep knowledge on Chinese characters. It was really fascinating. And I'm, I'm interested in your linguistic background and whatever you have uh, to share with our audience today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so I studied linguistics in college or university as a lot of our viewers would probably say. And um, that was kind of my springboard into a career in linguistic consulting. So I now run this linguistic consulting company, which provides uh, solutions to companies that have any kind of language problem. So they want to enter a new market and they need to know which languages to use, or they need to be able to pronounce very difficult languages um, in a speech or something like that. Any, any kind of linguistic solution essentially we provide, although we do specialize in Asian languages since that's where I'm based. So you might even have some solutions for, for us yes, here at I our company so. as well. I hope so. I'm a yeah. huge fan of, fan of Glossica. So you also have this amazing blog where you go into a lot of linguistic detail. Can you can share a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah. So this blog, uh, MissLinguistic.com, is, well, my mission with this blog is to try to make linguistics more accessible to people. So language science, essentially. Um, I know a lot of people are scared of all the terminology, they think it's a little bit too highbrow for them, but they don't realize that a lot of what you learn in linguistics can really directly help you target certain parts of a language that you're learning so that you can learn much more quickly, much more efficiently. And when I first started foreign languages, so I was monolingual until 18, I only spoke English until I was 18, and it wasn't until I studied linguistics that I finally was able to first acquire my foreign language. Um, it really was the springboard. It, it really helped me hone my strategies. And I want other people to know that you know, if they haven't been able to acquire a foreign language yet, it's not because they're not talented. It's not because they don't have the ability. They haven't just hit on that first right strategy for them. And linguistics can really help you hone that. But also, I mean, I, I truly believe that your first foreign language is also the hardest one to learn. So I, I take it that you probably learned some foreign language or languages in uh, high school before the age of 18, is that correct? Yes, I and attempted, struggled, and failed, yeah. So how do you think that linguistics actually helped you, uh, so you, you were able to understand a little bit more about the science and then it gave you some sort of a, a better understanding of how language works. Exactly. At what, at what point were you able to make a breakthrough? Was that with the, the same language or, or with a different language? Yeah, it was actually with the same language, um, that was Spanish. So I do have Spanish heritage, so I was highly motivated to learn Spanish because people always speak Spanish to me and I could never respond to them. Um, so I took Spanish in high school, you know, I did all the conjugations, I could write the essays, but I couldn't speak a word, and that was so frustrating. And it wasn't until I studied linguistics that I was really able to understand the why of why we were studying all these conjugations and, and the purpose of all these conjugations. And once I was able to understand, you know, give it a top-down kind of perspective of, oh, this is for this part of language, this is for this part of language, and give names to all of these things, that I was really able to organize it in my head and finally make sense of it. And that's when I finally made my first breakthrough, became fluent in Spanish, and man, that feeling, I'll never forget that feeling. And I think that my ego before then had been so bruised by you know being a native, or being a heritage, um, being someone that should have been a heritage speaker of Spanish and not being able to learn that language, that from there I just kind of went a little crazy and started learning a lot of other languages. And you know I can't recommend it enough, It's it's so, gratifying to become fluent in a language and to be able to have a conversation with a speaker and, and to reach that level. So what part of linguistics do you think is actually the most beneficial for people to kind of take a look at? Well, it's really hard to choose, um, but I would definitely say that phonetics has been huge for me. Um, understanding the difference between phonetics and phonology, which would be mm -hmm. the difference between <clears throat> just you know sounds out there in the ether um, and sounds that are actually relevant to any given language. So understanding that in this language, there's this repertoire of sounds, and these kind of sounds you can have, but they don't matter. Or this language has a completely different repertoire of sounds, and these ones really matter. And understanding how that works has really helped me target my learning of new languages and make sure that I can improve my pronunciation, make sure that I can understand speakers much better. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's been the most effective for me. 
uh, I've I've come across a lot of linguists in the last few years, and I frequently ask them a question is, um, if you could choose uh, between phonology, semantics, and syntax, what would be the one that you would like to spend the most time working on? It would have to be phonology. I have to say syntax is probably my least favorite course in university, not because so of my talk, So my talk kind of went over your head. No, I did no, love your you talk, not. although as soon as they saw the absolute of ergative, I was, oh god, no, not, not that. I mean, I, I have definitely... Um, rejected several foreign languages only because they're ergative languages. Um, so no ergativity for you. No ergativity. So <laughs> I definitely. Can, I, can, I can help you out with that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe I need to face my fears. <laughs> face your fears. That's always a good thing. I think um, I was uh, I was scared of ergativity up until about two or three years ago. Like I've been reading in linguistics and studying linguistics for for more than twenty years now, and. Ergativity was that one thing that was just always like, uh, I'm scared of it. Okay. I, okay, I'm actually admitting my fears, yeah. which, is, which is a healthy thing to do. But Well, it's a really helpful thing because if you got over it, then I feel like I could get over it. Too. No, it, I, think it, I think it's not just me. I think it's just everybody. When you say the word, and my speech was actually called languages without subject and object for a purpose. I didn't want to put ergativity because I didn't want to have just one right. guy in the audience. So right. I tried to attract people with a different title. So, um, and then I got through my speech halfway and I said, you know, welcome to ergativity. <laughs> and then everybody's like, us. <laughs> yeah, I tricked you. and then everybody says, oh my God. Okay, so, um, but I think it's a really, really cool concept. And I think that after really diving into ergativity, I realized how weird subject-object languages kind of force this paradigm onto real-world events, and I think ergativity is more match matches with real-world wow, events. Okay. So that's why I feel it's so, I feel it's like so so fascinating. Um, but yeah, I think if you look at the world that as real-world events and how they happen, and then you say this is how you describe it with ergativity, and then you translate that back to your subject-object language, you'll you'll realize wow, subject-object languages sometimes are kind of quirky. Okay, you're selling me. You're selling me. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll give it a chance. I'll give it a chance. And that's, yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing that I've been doing with my blog is trying to convince people that these language science terms and these language science co concepts are not so scary. And if yeah, you just not. can put a word on something, you put a name on something, it can really help you just understand a concept and it can help you with your language learning. You know why I think the word is so scary to most linguists or anybody else? is because of the sounds in the word. You have er, mm. er. That's and so true. Erg sounds like U-R-G-G, -G, like, like scary. Something very negative. You know, yeah. erg to yeah. me. And so everyone's just like, I don't like that word. <laughs> yeah. They don't know why. Yeah, that's You know, definitely. but it, it starts with that sound. So that's kind of an interesting um, phono-semantic uh, meta-analysis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we get really nerdy about this. Oh, we can get really <laughs> nerdy about it. And I'm going to try to keep it on the level, but, you know, you could go down a rabbit hole, so. There's a, a really fascinating uh, concept about Chinese that I found, is that since you also know Chinese really well, this is a, a fascinating uh, phono-semantic mapping mm -hmm. with the language. Can you think of any word in Chinese that ends with an an, whether that's ban, yuan, wan, that does not have a, a roundish semantic relation to it? <laughs> Or I should say, or I should make it the other way around. How many words can you think None. of? None. How many words can you think of that have a round relationship, a round semantic that end with the an sound? That do have a round semantic. Yeah, I guess it's sometimes it's harder to think of the, the, the negative, but if if you can think of how many words can you think of in Chinese that end in an that have this round semantic? How? Because can we if go I, from literally round, like manzu, like to satisfy? Because or? satisfy is like fulfill. Yeah. And if you fill something up, That's it's, kind of it's round. full yeah. and round, right? Exactly. So I was thinking about fan, the food fan. that you eat. Uh -huh. It comes in a round bowl. Right. And what do you call a bowl? One. Cool. And, yeah. and the, the bowl is shaped like a circle. What do you call a circle? Tan. Oh, wait, yuan? Oh, no, no. No, yeah. I'm on the spot. I'm forgetting my basic. How do you how do you uh, make a spiral in Chinese? Oh, I don't know how to make a spiral. Like curly hair. Juan, juan the tofa, okay. right? Oh. And to to twist something oh, into a, okay. uh, like a drill. Uh huh. Juan. Oh. 
Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's so cool. So, like, there's a lot of these twisting and turning movements, zhuan one, uh -huh. right, to go around the corner. Uh -huh. So I, I find Chinese really fascinating, and I think that a lot of languages have this, this uh, phono-semantic relationship yeah. between them. Oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you can find more of these in Chinese, like the words that end in yang, usually have like two parallel opposite sides with each other. There's a lot of oh, these wow. things. Yeah. Okay, well that's a Wikipedia rabbit hole I'm going to go down. Like the word for river, jiang. Uh, yeah. And xiang, like a, a, an alley. Yeah, <laughs> so there's a lot of words that have this kind of like phonosemantic uh, relationship. Yeah. I, I find that fascinating with languages. Yeah. What, what are some of the things that you found fascinating with uh, phonology? Oh, with phonology. I guess just the, for me, the, the part of phonology that just really still blows my mind is that you can have two sounds that in one language are just, you know, variations on the same sound. Just a different way you might say sound if you had been suddenly hit in the back or, you know, if, if you were extra tired that day. And for another language, those two sounds will be completely different sounds and completely change the meaning of the word. That oh, okay. is still just a bizarre concept to me, it's but kind it's of so like crucial the, um... to understanding pronunciation. Like you're talking about, like the allophones, right? Some exactly. so in some languages they're allophones, exactly. but in another language they're separate sounds. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Allophones versus phonemes, and understanding that concept helps so much with understanding pronunciation. Yeah. It's like in English we can say um, that the T in computer. You're right. Exactly. If we say computer, it sounds like it's forced. Yeah. But, but it's an, still the same an word. Italian or French speaker or Spanish speaker would. They're not really familiar with the t sound because it doesn't really exist in the language. They only have the d sound, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, that comes up all the time in Korean, um, making those distinctions, especially those concepts. You have a three-way distinction. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much for uh, yeah. for joining my, me today uh, for this uh, talk, and I hope we uh, have the chance to uh, talk again. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.